After World War II, peacetime military strategy changed fairly dramatically as a consequence of what the world learned during the war alongside the technologies that were developed, or which had already been developed but which were finally implemented, teaching everyone involved a whole lot about what works, what doesn't, and how we might do better next time around. Better in this context defined in terms of achieving a military victory while experiencing as little devastation as possible back on the home front. One of the most fundamental shifts that emerged in the latter half of the 20th century, though, was oriented around one technology in particular, or rather one collection of related technologies that are often lumped together, nuclear weapons. It's thought that the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, at least in part to demonstrate to the world, to their potential future military opponents, that the U.S. had the biggest stick and wasn't afraid to use it. These attacks were also thought to save the United States the lives and resources that would have otherwise been expended during an island invasion against what was considered to be a fanatical enemy, while also serving as a real-world proof of concept as to the capabilities of these new weapons. Tests had been done, enough to make deploying them a good bet, but we still weren't 100% certain as to what we could expect in terms of fallout, in terms of the different levels of devastation that might be wrought based on how high up the bombs were detonated, and in terms of how human beings in the blast zone, just beyond the blast zone, and within the same country but well away from the blast zone, would respond to such weapons. Those lessons were learned or at least the fundamentals were picked up. Testing continued for many decades, though, and still continues to a limited degree today, though it's not the United States doing these tests. It's primarily North Korea, though India and Pakistan also tested nuclear weapons after the rest of the nuclear weapon-armed world halted testing in the early 1990s. For a period of about four years, though, from 1945 until 1949, the United States was the only nation with nuclear weapons, having achieved their first successful test, the Trinity Test, in July of 1945, before dropping the so-called Little Boy and Fat Man bombs, uranium and plutonium-based weapons, respectively, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. Through a combination of their own weapons program and some incredibly successful espionage, the Soviet Union tested their first nuclear weapon in August of 1949, something that came as a bit of a shock in U.S. military circles, which had been spending much of their post-war effort distributing nuclear weapons around the world to ensure they could pop them into high-altitude bombers if they needed to from wherever they were located, giving them a good deal of range for what was still a relatively unsophisticated weapon, in terms of delivery mechanism, at least. They were also trying to figure out who should manage these weapons, wondering first if they should fall under the auspices of the United Nations, before instead deciding to form a new United States Department, the United States Atomic Energy Commission, with the express purpose of managing these resources and the resultant bombs, an agency that, by the way, was civilian instead of military in nature. So during those four years, the United States was spending a lot of time and attention figuring out how to get these bombs where they might be needed, focusing especially on defending against a conventional invasion of Europe by the Soviet Union. And they weren't certain that they could stop such an invasion, even with the benefit of nukes, due to the complexities of fallout and the possibility that the Soviets could divide their forces in such a way that atomic bombs would do more harm than good. Then, the Soviets became a nuclear weapon-armed nation, and the state of play changed substantially. Nuclear warfare is considered to be a very different thing than traditional warfare because of the massively upscaled damage that can be done in a very short period of time. You could, theoretically, destroy an entire city and kill everyone in it using just swords and axes, or quite a bit faster than that, with guns and tanks. But you could do so in an instant and from a distance with an atomic bomb. And that capability changed the mathematics of war. 
Thus, new military doctrines had to be established, and new grand strategies, new collections of assumptions and risk assessments, had to be worked out and formalized. One of the core doctrines that emerged during this time, in the years following the nuclearization of the Soviet Union, was that of mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction says that, in essence, if two sides have nukes, then one side cannot use their nukes on the other side without the understood potential that they may be nuked in return. The outcome, then, is that neither side is incentivized to attack the other or to disarm, potentially ever, because as long as that balance sticks, both sides' arsenals are effectively neutralized. But if that balance ever wobbles, ever faces some kind of imbalance, the whole thing falls apart. And other strategies, like the concept of first strike, where you justify nuking someone who isn't directly threatening you, because if you don't, they might someday be able to first strike you for the same reason. Those concepts come into play if that equilibrium is upset, and things can get a lot more volatile pretty quickly. To maintain this stability, one of the core features of modern nuclearized military strategy is maintaining some version of what, in the United States at least, is called the nuclear triad. This triad, as the name implies, is made up of three components, nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles in silos located on land, nuclear weapons mounted on bombers on planes, and ballistic missiles hidden in secretive submarines all around the world. The idea is that if another country were to somehow figure out where all of our strategic bombers are, or the fueling stations for those bombers, neutralizing them, putting them out of commission, that still would not eliminate our ability to counterstrike anyone who attacks us. The same is true for any of the other legs of this triad, and that means that it is far less likely that anyone could ever catch the U.S. unable to counterstrike. Which means, even if we were nuked into oblivion, we'd almost certainly be able to take our attacker and their interests with us. This is the mutually assured destruction doctrine, expanded and reinforced by a collection of infrastructure bent on maintaining the ability to strike anyone who might strike us, which in turn makes it, theoretically at least, far less likely that anyone will strike anyone because that would almost certainly ensure global destruction, eliminating the benefits most nation-states would be aiming for in attacking another nation-state in the first place. Now, this is not a perfect system, and it arguably rigs certain aspects of these defense systems with a hair trigger, so that if anything goes wrong, or seems to be going wrong, if there's a glitch, one of the nine or so nations around the world that have nukes and that have such fail-safes in place could respond to a seeming military catalyst too strongly, leading to a sequence of events that leaves the world, or at least a few cities, in ruins. That said, it's also a doctrine that arguably helped us survive the Cold War without ever launching a nuclear weapon in anger, post-World War II anyway and has allowed the world to cobble together other incentives not to nuke each other in the meantime, including globalized economic systems and supply chains and global governing bodies, which could potentially punish successful nuclear aggressors, even if no nuclear counterstrike is launched. This system is still fairly fundamental at this point, and flawed as it is, we will be treading in unfamiliar territory if we ever find ourselves in a world in which this uneasy truce, enforced by arsenals of weapons on all sides, pointed at all the other sides, were to ever disappear asymmetrically. If it were to ever become unbalanced, in other words, so that one side retains the ability to strike and the other does not, that could be a serious issue. What I want to talk about today is a weapons technology that may pose precisely that risk and what its current and near future implementation might mean for military strategy and for the global balance of power. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. So this is the first episode of the show that I'm recording post-tour. I have been on a speaking tour around North America, also dipping my toes into the UK briefly there, for the past 10 months, if you can believe it. 
and my heart is just so full. I had such a blast. I learned so much. I met so many wonderful people, so many gracious locals welcoming me to each new city that I went to, that I spoke at. And I'd just like to thank everybody who came out to these shows. I met a whole lot of listeners at each of these events. And so if you managed to make it out to one of these events, Thank you so very much. You made this experience just an absolutely wonderful experience for me. And I am looking forward to the next opportunity that I have to do a similar tour. There's a very good chance that in the near future, I will also figure out a more modular way to do regular speaking events wherever I happen to be, or if I'm in easy traveling distance to different locations. So stay tuned for word about those types of potential events as well. But in the meantime, just thank you so very much. I am thrilled that I was able to undertake such a project, that I was able to experience that kind of difficult but rewarding set of circumstances. And I am looking forward to focusing, now that I'm done with the tour, more time and attention on Let's Know Things, on the show and other supplementary efforts, some of which are already in existence and some of which I am planning on experimenting with in the near future. So all that was a blast, and I think these next steps are going to be a whole lot of fun, too. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool this week comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, Hypersonic Missiles Are Unstoppable and they're starting a new global arms race. Let's get some foundational information in place here, and then we will jump into the ramifications of what this ostensibly unstoppable technology might pretend. A rocket is a type of projectile that is self-propelled. That is, it's got its own source of power, like gunpowder or some other more modern type of explosive, and it is unguided. You launch a rocket, and it goes in the direction that you pointed it. There are rockets in the field and under development that have an added GPS-based guiding component, which essentially allows older rocket launchers to fire a type of smart rocket that can adjust its course as its target moves. But in general, a rocket is a thing that you launch, and it goes in the direction that it is launched. A missile, in contrast, is a guided projectile that is often a bit more complex and more like a vehicle than a big bullet, which is sort of what a rocket is, though again, there's a lot of variety under that umbrella term, and in some cases, it is tricky to distinguish a guided rocket from a missile, the distinction mostly being in how they are categorized by their manufacturers. Most missiles are made up of guidance systems, flight systems, engines, often jet engines, and some kind of warhead. That warhead can be a traditional explosive arranged in a variety of shapes and compositions to achieve different effects against different sorts of targets. But it can also include nuclear devices, chemical weapons, or biological agents. The very first early missiles were deployed by the German military during World War II. The V-1 flying bomb, the V standing for Vergeltungswaffe, which translates as vengeance weapon. The V-1 flying bomb was exactly what it sounds like, a bomb on a simple plane that was meant to fly a limited range and then explode upon hitting its target, which at the time was London. The V-2 rocket, the successor to the V-1, was arguably the world's first true long-range guided ballistic missile. They did away with a lot of the plane-like components and refined the weapon into what we think of when we think of missiles today, a pointy rod with fins at the back and a plume of fire behind it that propels it. The V-2 is called a ballistic missile because it utilizes gravity for a great deal of its travel. The missile is launched along a guided course, way up into the air, and then it swoops down from its apex, allowing gravity to pull it down to the thing that it's intended to hit, taking air resistance and angle of ascent and descent into account to ensure that it lands where it's supposed to land. The V-1 that I mentioned earlier, on the other hand, is an example of what's called a cruise missile, a missile that is self-powered all the way through, from beginning to end, which allows it to have a constant speed from point A to point B, but can also leave it open to interception along the way, potentially. So broadly, a ballistic missile is like throwing a ball in the air, 
ball ballistic. You toss it up, high up into the atmosphere, and from way up in the sky, at times all the way into what counts as space, it drops its payload, and that payload strikes its target down on the ground, completing that parabolic arc. A cruise missile cruises all the way to its target under its own power, which allows it to, at times, scoot along at nearly ground level, dodging radar and anti-missile systems, and carrying large payloads across decent distances. Ballistic missiles will often show up on radar, but they move so fast after hitting their apex, and can be fired from such a long distance away that they are feared for their out of nowhereness. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, for instance, can strike just about anywhere on the planet from just about anywhere else on the planet in something like 30 to 40 minutes, which is totally nuts. There are also what's called tactical or theater ballistic missiles that operate on the same up and down parabolic arc concept, but which go up a far shorter distance and crash down somewhere relatively nearby, often within a war zone. And there are all sorts of purposes for cruise missiles shot from air, land, and sea, striking targets in the air, on land, and in the sea. Both missiles and rockets that travel underwater to strike in-water targets, by the way, are generally referred to as torpedoes. You can have a missile launched from a submarine that then travels to its target under its own power, a cruise missile, or using gravity for the latter part of its trajectory, a ballistic missile, and those will be missiles, not torpedoes, but only as long as they leave the water to strike a non-water target. If they are in the water to hit a water target, they are generally called torpedoes. Now that is a super simple rundown of the basics of this type of wartime weaponry, and it doesn't get into a lot of the specifics of composition and deployment and circumstance, which further complexifies the nomenclature at times, but it's a good fundamental start for understanding today's topic. One more thing to note before we move on, though, is that the nuclear triad, which I mentioned in the intro, is largely predicated today on missiles of various kinds. Cruise missiles from aircraft, nuclear payloads perched atop ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, stuck in silos, and in submarines all over the place in hidden locations. And that combination of nukes deployed all over the planet, all of which could strike just about anywhere, anytime, if the U.S. is ever nuked, is the premise of the triad. Russia has their own version of the triad, as does China and the U.K. and all the other countries that have at least one nuclear device they have a means of ensuring their device or devices can still get vengeance against their attacker if the government is wiped out. Ensuring that mutually assured destruction component is in place is what makes them, ostensibly at least, immune to first strike attacks from other nations with nukes, according to this doctrine anyway. Now that said, the speed of sound, the speed at which a sound wave travels through the air, is about 1,235 kilometers per hour, which is about 767 miles per hour. This varies quite a bit based on altitude and temperature, the medium through which the sound is moving, basically. So it's radically different through water compared to upper atmosphere air. But those are the general numbers that we use when discussing the speed of sound as it travels through an idealized average sort of air. When we say a vehicle travels at Mach 1, we are saying that that vehicle travels at the speed of sound in the particular medium in which it currently exists. So a submarine traveling at Mach 1 would be very different than a jet traveling at Mach 1, because presumably one of them would be traveling through the water, while the other would be traveling through a thin sort of upper atmosphere air. And sound travels very differently through these two different mediums. A ballistic missile that has been shot up past the atmosphere that is falling back down to Earth to strike a target after reaching its ultimate height will often strike its target at somewhere between 4 and 5 miles per second, which is between 14,400 and 18,000 miles per hour, something like Mach 2 to Mach 2.5, two and, a half. Two and, two and a half times the speed of sound, respectively. That is very, very fast. That means these missiles easily outpace the sound of their own movement 
creating all kinds of interesting physical effects, like audible shockwaves and visible vapor cones, clouds of condensed water that will sometimes form what looks like a little skirt around planes and other vehicles that are moving at transonic, that is faster than the speed of sound, speeds. Many cruise missiles travel far more slowly than a descending ballistic missile. The famous and seemingly ubiquitous cruise missile of the 1990s and early 2000s, for instance, the Tomahawk land attack missile, is subsonic, meaning it travels below the speed of sound at about Mach 0.74, so not quite three-fourths of the way to the speed of sound on average. There are other cruise missiles that do break the sound barrier, most of which have been developed and deployed by Russia and China, or which were developed earlier by the Soviet Union before it became Russia. But although these missiles travel much faster than their subsonic kin, between Mach 1 and Mach 3 and a half on average, they often sacrifice distance for that speed. And a lot of the faster ones, the intercontinental scale cruise missiles developed during the Cold War, have since been replaced with ballistic versions of the same because of the long range benefits of ballistic models for that particular use case. Let's loop back around to that article in the Times, and a quick reminder that the headline was Hypersonic Missiles Are Unstoppable, and they're starting a new global arms race. Now, there's only one publicly known, fully deployed hypersonic missile type on the planet, as of the day I'm recording this in July of 2019. That missile is the 3M22 Zircon, developed by Russia, and it's a cruise missile that is powered by a type of scramjet, a scramjet being a type of jet engine that can suck up air from the atmosphere, even while moving at supersonic speeds, deriving its oxidizing agent from that air, which in turn allows the engine to maintain combustion, shooting it forward at very high speeds. This missile, the 3M22 Zircon, is believed to be capable of traveling at Mach 8 to Mach 9 which is just staggeringly fast. Recall that most existing very fast cruise missiles top out at around Mach 4, which itself is four times the speed of sound. And other hypersonic missiles of various types that are currently in development by Russia and other countries are thought to be capable of speeds in the Mach 15 to Mach 20 range. There are some fundamental changes that occur when you move something that fast, including the possibility that this missile will be sheathed in plasma due to the heat created by its intense speed. And that plasma, in turn, could make this missile essentially invisible to radar detection systems, an effect called plasma stealth. This is thought to be an issue even with the current, relatively slower 3M22 Zircon that is already in play and other potential side effects and benefits could be seen in those far faster, not yet deployed models. Consequently, there are concerns within the United States military establishment that even in its infancy, this type of hypersonic missile could bypass the missile defenses that are currently in place, creating a very non-ideal situation for the US and its allies, but also, more broadly, the world very much including the Russians who reportedly began deploying the Zircon in 2017, and which will be doing so in earnest more broadly in 2020. The reasons for that broader concern tie back to the nuclear triad and the uneasy stability that it has created around the world. Right now, if the United States were to launch a nuclear strike against Russia for some reason, or against one of Russia's allies, Russia could strike back just as quickly and destroy the United States, mutually assured destruction. That keeps either side from succumbing to that potentially apocalyptic, violent temptation. What's more, there's an implicit dead man switch in play here, because of the nuclear triad, or the local equivalent of the nuclear triad, perhaps with just two or maybe four or five different points of failure that would need to be knocked out for a successful, no counter-strike nuclear attack. So even if the US totally destroyed Russia, Russia would still get to counterattack. Following that logic, it generally makes sense not to attack anyone with these weapons, because you will get hit back just as hard, if not harder. That logic could change, though, if weapons existed that adjusted the time frame in which players on all sides are making decisions, 
or if some new weapon came along that could potentially allow a country's nukes to be completely or mostly knocked out. That could lead to tweaks in expectations and predicted response patterns, and thus would require a change in stance, potentially at least. And even just that potential when it comes to nuclear war or a global war of any flavor, which could be sparked by this kind of weapon for reasons that I'll get into momentarily, that's a pretty big deal. Right now, hypersonic missiles are thought to be most useful as a means of punching through hardened targets, hardened in the literal sense, by some kind of armor or other protection, but also hardened by anti-missile defenses and things of that nature. So an aircraft carrier, which is generally considered to be an immensely formidable military force bristling with jets and helicopters and missiles and guns and armor and all kinds of surveillance systems and radar, including those that would let them knock most types of weaponry out of the sky, would probably be unable, as of right now, to defend against a hypersonic missile. That's an incredibly expensive piece of equipment, plus all the other equipment that is stored in and on it that would be rendered useless by a currently expensive but way less expensive than an aircraft carrier single-shot projectile, a projectile that could be fired from relatively far away and that could potentially, in the near future, be in the hands of entities, nation-states and otherwise, that are looking for exactly this type of asymmetric advantage against far larger, better-funded opponents. The logic of modern warfare, though, says that things don't even need to get that far, don't even need to result in an actual attack before threats are assessed and countermoves are taken, preemptive countermoves, potentially. So you have nukes. I need nukes to make sure that you do not use your nukes. You have a means of destroying my aircraft carriers, my bases, potentially my nuclear weapon launch facilities. Meaning, you have a means of potentially destroying them all before I even know what's happening due to the speed of those weapons and my inability to protect against them. And as such, I need to have as many of those hypersonic missiles as possible as well. And if I do not have them, or if I cannot get them fast enough, well, it's probably best that we just both have them, because the alternative under this logic is a preemptive strike against a force that cannot be defended against. And that kind of strike under the pre-existing logic of mutually assured destruction is something that could very easily spark a conflict that could very quickly escalate into something that we cannot take back. The use-it-or-lose-it pressures that emerge when these sorts of weapons enter the field are immense stressors. They strain these sorts of balances because it makes those who do not have the shiniest, newest weapons feel like they need to reassess the entity that does have them and determine if that entity will use their edge, temporary or otherwise, before everyone else has a chance to catch up. Are there enough checks and balances in place, in other words, to keep the temporary dominant weapons holder from making use of said weapons during the period when they have them and no one else does? Do we trust those structures, or is this something that we need to do something about before they have the chance to potentially harm us in some meaningful and potentially permanent way? There are other frightening potential use cases for this sort of weapon as well that play to its strengths as a relatively short range, as missiles go, very fast-moving projectile with limited destructive capabilities compared to a nuke or even a massive conventional warhead, but which cannot, for now at least, be defended against with any certainty. For instance, from that New York Times piece, quote, Hypersonic missiles are also ideal for waging a decapitation strike, assassinating a country's top military or political officials. Instant leader killers, a former Obama administration White House official who asked not to be named, said in an interview, end quote. I've read a few pieces of fiction over the years where the plot revolved around a futuristic weapon that allowed some group or another to fire a laser from space, from a satellite, killing anyone that they like, wherever they like on the planet at any time with an attack coming from the sky out of nowhere. And the out of nowhere-ness of such an attack was the truly thrilling, terrifying component of that plot. You can set things up so that gunmen and other types of attacks with conventional weaponry are not likely, and you can counter anything that sneaks through, almost certainly. But what about an indefensible missile 
fired from a distance that moves so fast that there's no chance of existing anti-missile countermeasures dealing with it, much less anyone on the ground seeing it coming. Combined with its ability to puncture armor and penetrate several levels of a building due to its high speed, that terror aspect of this weapon makes it a compelling potential assassination tool. Now imagine if you knew that, knew that with the push of a button, your enemy could kill your government's leadership, your military leaders could knock out your radar systems, could destroy your stock market, your military bases could take out your electrical grid or water reservoirs. What kind of math might that cause you to start doing? What kind of plans, countermeasures, or pre-measures, pre-strikes, might become thinkable under such circumstances, with that kind of sword of Damocles hanging over your country's or your own head all day every day? Further, what if you suspected that an opponent of yours, another large nation, let's say, with a lot to lose, would not risk their position on the global stage by launching a preemptive strike on your interests? But you also knew that they could feed the information that they hold, feed the technology or even just some finished weapons to another entity that has no such qualms. It's not unthinkable that terrorist organizations or isolated rogue nations might be willing to use this type of weapon, knowing that they have less to lose, and potentially quite a bit to gain by pulling one over on their hated much larger enemy, on the US, on China, on France, on whomever. By punching above their weight class, they could garner the prestige that they crave. And this would be one way to do so that would almost guarantee, at least for now, that their strike, whatever or whomever they chose to target, would be successful. We will almost certainly reach a point within a few years where enough entities have missiles with these capabilities that we create a new standoff, similar to the one that we're in today. But in the meantime, things will be a little bit tenuous. Power balances may shift, opportunities may be taken, and even if nothing serious, nothing physical happens, the fact that it could, that unto itself, could create a spark because of the potentially devastating consequences of allowing someone else to launch a first strike under modern standoff conditions. There are already countermeasures in the works, of course, above and beyond the budgets being allocated for the production of hypersonic weapons themselves. There are also energy weapons meant to fry missile components in a fraction of a second, being pushed through development faster than in previous years because they have shown promise as a potential defense against missiles of this kind. It's also looking a lot more likely that AI-based systems, automated to move humans further out of the missile defense loop, could be deployed, or at least taken more seriously, as every second becomes more meaningful in terms of deciding what is an attack and what is just a glitch in the system. This unto itself is a bit of a game changer, as having humans involved has, in the past, saved us several times from World War III instigating decisions and mistakes. A human being made a choice that kept us all from doing some incredibly stupid things. But it's also possible that such a shift toward more autonomous versions of this type of standoff could protect us from future human errors and could establish a truly stable balance elevated above the emotions and grogginess and biases and similar human issues that can muck up even the most beautifully balanced technological system. There are some indications that the nations funding hypersonic research may be doing their best to ensure the worst-case potential outcomes associated with this type of tech and its deployment will not come to be. Some of the publicly available data from hypersonic missile tests show, for instance, that when a version of hypersonic missile that uses glide vehicles are flown, they can look quite a bit like nuclear weapon-tipped ICBMs to other countries' radars. So engineers have given these weapons a far steeper angle of re-entry toward the ground, making it less likely that they will be mistaken for a nuclear weapon by folks on the receiving end. Now, this doesn't mean that the nation on the receiving end of that attack will not strike back, and potentially with everything that they've got, but it at least makes a full-on, use-it-or-lose-it world-ending rain of missiles a whole lot less likely, due to that detectable difference in behavior. They will see this as a regular missile moving very fast, 
rather than as a city-killing doomsday device, potentially at least. There's also word that the United States, at least, is looking into expanding their space-based sensor array so that hypersonic missiles can be detected in flight, something that is not currently reliably possible after their first launch stage because of the speed at which they move. The United States is also making investments in the missiles themselves, with a couple of models in development through military contractors, with an estimated delivery date for models that could be mass-produced by sometime in 2021 or 2022. Russia has their 3M22 already deployed, but has other models in development, and the UK and France are collaborating on a few models of hypersonic missile to replace existing missiles that they use broadly throughout their military forces today. There are not concrete dates for the arrival of these presumably next-gen hypersonic weapons, but the assumptions being made in the military press, at least, indicate it will probably be at least a few years before they have anything actually usable, ready to go. India recently attempted to test a hypersonic engine on one of their existing missile models, but failed to get the missile high enough to get the scramjet component working. I suspect, based on how well their space program has been going, that they will get that figured out before the end of the year, which could lead to uncomfortable new realities with Pakistan, a country with whom they have an arguably even more uneasy standoff than the one between the U.S. and China, or the other one between the U.S. and Russia. China, of the half-dozen or so countries that are confirmed to be working on hypersonic missile technologies right now, was recently declared to be the furthest ahead in terms of raw technological sophistication by a panel that keeps tabs on such things. And there have been deployment tests of unannounced, seemingly hypersonic vehicles and weapons caught on camera by Chinese citizens and then posted to the internet over the past year or so. The China strategy here has the most potential, I would argue, to upend certain aspects of international economic and military balance as they seem to be building these weapons with the primary purpose of expanding their aura of influence, fully reinforcing their position in the South China Sea, among other geographic locations. And they plan to line their coast with these weapons, which would allow them to say to anyone who steps into their territory, or what they claim as their territory, that they will be sunk to the bottom of the ocean if they do not leave right now. And once they have these sorts of missiles in their arsenal, the American aircraft carrier groups that have allowed the U.S. to dominate and police global trade since World War II will be, if not totally anachronistic, almost certainly less useful and influential when it comes to military posturing. When doing military math, big centers of power, like aircraft carriers, once considered very mighty and durable, would instead become just very big, very expensive targets for this kind of missile. Targets that would be easily sunk and thus more easily dismissed when it comes to negotiations. These developmental timelines are all very speculative at the moment, and there is a good chance there's posturing happening on all sides, with some developments being exaggerated and others being held back. It's a solid bet that all of these countries have secret efforts, perhaps already in place or perhaps nearly ready to be implemented, alongside the ones that they've announced publicly. There's also a chance that in the meantime, as hypersonic missile technology is slowly deployed, that some other technology comes along and renders it moot, or that some shiny new countermeasure emerges, leaving these nations with just another batch of very expensive weapons, all pointed at each other that they all hope that they never have a good reason to use. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also help support the show non-monetarily by leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts, by sharing the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it, or by sharing it on your social network of choice. All of these efforts help a whole lot more than you might suspect and only take a moment of your time, and they are all, whatever shape they take, very much appreciated. Thank you very much to everyone who has already helped in some way to make this show happen each week. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Falter, Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? 
by Bill McKibben. This is a strangely appropriate book recommendation for this episode, an episode about standoffs and potential ways that we might destroy ourselves as a species. This book is a little bit pessimistic, but arguably not irrationally so. The author is definitely a man with an opinion, politically and otherwise, so you may recognize his name, you may not, but he's somebody who is pretty decently well known for having a bunch of opinions about a bunch of different things. But this book and his focus, particularly on things that could go wrong and things that we are doing that amplify the potential of things going wrong, I think is a poignant and important counterpoint to a lot of the, at times, irrational optimism that we have in a lot of spaces. Now, I personally tend to think that we can be rationally optimistic and see the positive things in the world while also trying to solve problems, but it's important to recognize just how close to catastrophe we do come at times. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with taking a look at the other side of that spectrum in terms of how we respond to the data that we have available to make sure that we are fully aware of the different ways of looking at this data so that we can adjust our actions and how we approach these things, these problems of ours, appropriately. So if you want to hear more about what could go wrong with the environment, with AI, with the way that we've set up our societies, with our seeming inability to share the wealth that we've created over the past century or so, consider picking up a copy of Falter by Bill McKibben. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode, along with transcripts of more recent episodes at letsnotethings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of them, though it's just Colin Wright on Facebook. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.